Welcome back to Stuff About Money. They did not teach you in school. I'm Xavier Angel, Certified Financial Planner, and I'm joined with my co-host, Eric Garcia, Certified Financial Planner. How are you doing today? Man, I am um, I'm doing all right. It's cold here in New Orleans. It's, it's March 20th we're recording. It was supposed to be spring. We had spring, and then we got winter again. So other than that, I'm, uh, I'm all right. Tell me about it. Bo wanted to go back out walking this morning. It was 37 degrees, 6 o'clock this morning, 545, 6 o'clock this morning when he wanted to go out. So That's when you uh, let him go to the bathroom in the house, huh? I just put him out in the backyard and let him go. I was like, I'm not going out with you. You're on your own. Very cool. All right. And then we're supposed to be in 80, mid-80s this weekend. I know. It's crazy weather. Yeah, so, so gumbo tonight, crawfish this weekend. There you go. I like it. <laughs> All right. What we got going on today, Xavier? We've got uh we got a great guest coming on. Um, I'm gonna let you go ahead and, and introduce him. He's a good friend of yours. He's been on um, I think you guys had him on one of your other podcasts yeah. with um Yeah, a couple of years ago. Um so we got John Hoopalo with us. John, how are you doing? I'm doing great. And by the way, I, I'm here sorry to hear about this winter time in New Orleans. I'm coming down there next week. So heat it up for us, will you boys? <laughs> oh yeah, hey, it'll, it'll be it'll be warm next week. It, yeah, next right. week it's going to be in the mid '80s, so you're good next right. week. So you're All up right. in New well, York, right? What, what's going on in New York? Uh, same thing. It's cold here. It was uh, it's like 32 or something like that. And our little guy Henry, maybe uh, you'll love this. I, sometimes I take him out at three in the morning. He's 14 year old dog, so I don't have a lot of like uh, a control over the situation. Let's just say. <laughs> Y'all think y'all must think we're weak when it comes to the weather up there. Huh? No, 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 okay. no, no. Cool. So anyway, John, John, you are the um, founder and CEO of My College Corner, right? So you are a college um, planning funding expert guy. Yeah, I'm. I'm a father of two college graduates and a former CFO of a publicly traded student loan company. I was an investment banker before that, and the reason I didn't say expert is that. I kind of learned as I went, you know, and what I learned um, was that everyone's equally confused. And I, I said to my co-founder one day, my kids are going through this. His kids were going through this. And we felt like deer in the headlights, They're like, what's wrong with this picture? We spent our whole careers trying to help other people. And then it's my turn to step to the plate. And I'm looking around saying, wait, these fastballs are going by me. I got to start hitting them. Hmm. Yeah, you, I just you, know, you, out you mentioned you mentioned um, you feel like a deer in the headlights. I've had two go through. I've got um, my second is graduated in May, but I, I still don't feel like I've got a grasp on it. And we've got a 12 year old coming up behind. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking for your knowledge. I just yeah. filled out uh, FAFSA this weekend, as a matter of fact. And like, I, I feel totally exposed. I feel like I feel like I absolutely 100 percent ruined my my kids uh, ability to get money from the federal government. Um, I feel like I answered every question incorrectly. Um, <laughs> and, and you know, I wish I could tell you, boy, you're not having an experience that everybody else is having because I don't think there's one person that closes that application, hits submit, and says, "Okay, what did I do wrong?" Right? That's that's. And by the way, this has not changed. This is exactly why we're all talking about this today. And this yeah. is the problem with like the whole higher education system from 20 years ago. People said, "I don't understand this," and you know, 10 years ago, "I don't understand this," and today. We don't understand this. So yeah. there's a way to understand it. We just have to be, you know, start getting to the bottom of it. I think it's one of those <laughs> things you understand it once you go through it, unfortunately. All right, all right. Before we get into talking about too much about college, all right, we'll stay on the okay. education track. Okay. I am, I am dying. I've been dying to ask you this question. So a guy who's made his living in education, right? College education. So we want to know, Xavier and I want to know, and all of our listeners want to know what's one thing about money, John, that you know today that you wish you would have learned in school? You know, the one thing I learned about money, we were just talking about this, is that you can't learn about money in school. It's a hands-on thing. It really is. And so, you know, they can teach you about supply and demand curves and all that sort of stuff. And they can say, oh, you know, money is about making choices and what your wants and your needs are. You know, none of that made any sense to me until I started actually getting out there and, and using the money. You know, it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, but here's a, this is a crazy thing. In New York, three weeks ago, I could buy strawberries for like $5 for a little container. And mm -hmm. then the next week, they were $2.50. And then a week after that, I'm not kidding, $12.99. Same, same, same thing. Supply, demand. My wants, so I wanted the strawberries. I didn't need them. So when they were $5, I said, oh, you know, all right, I'll buy them. When they were $2.50, I bought two of them. When they were $13, I said, you know what? 
I'm going someplace else with my money. And you can't, you know, you can't really teach that in school. So I, when I, I have a lot of sympathy for um, the 20 somethings and my daughters, they're, they're 29 and 27. And I go through this with them all the time. I, we talked about this at dinner. We, you know, we talked about it when they're, and you know, so what's a checking account? Do I have a checking account or do I have a savings account? I mean, these are real conversations I've had with my daughters in the last five years. Um, like you, Eric, I filled out a FAFSA form with my daughter. She wants to go to graduate school. So she called me last week. Same thing. She knew what to do, but that form felt so daunting to her. And so I think you just kind of have to learn your way. It's not academic. Money is not about academics, right? Unless you're going to be an economist and you want to go sit in the Fed or wherever you want to sit. For us in real life, money is about the first time you get that money in your hand. And then the government says, oh, by the way, I want some of that. I don't know if your, your kids have gone through this yet, but they get, my daughter's got their first job. So they say, oh, I'm going to make, you know, look at all these dollars. And they're like, wait a minute. What, what happened to the other 40 percent of it when, I, when my, my check came? It was like a real conversation with both of them. I said I just presented to a group of high schoolers, about 25 high schoolers. And I said, all right, you got a job. You got a, You earned $1,000, right? You worked $10 an hour, 100 hours. You got $1,000. How much money do you have to spend? A thousand dollars. Like, no, you don't. <laughs> you forgot to pay your partner, the IRS. <laughs> you yeah. got to pay them first. Yeah. So these so, are real life lessons, you know, and, and, and I don't think, you right. know, they can teach us that in school, but maybe I fell asleep that day, but it's not until you really like, there it is. Do I want the strawberries or not? You know, and do I have the money for it? And if not, how am I going to get the money? Do I want to save for it? And I think that's the whole thing around college too. It's the same thing. It's like, you know, you know colleges and, and education opportunities. And, and we, I think last time it was a couple of years ago now, Eric, but we talked about credentialing versus, you know, where you go to, to should everybody go get a four-year degree? And the answer is no, right? But how do you know? Um, so I, I think this all comes to play and it's the same question played out in lots of different ways. Yeah. So, um, I, I think that's good. I think experience is often the best teacher, uh, and and hopefully, 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 you have a a good head on your shoulders to where you you lean into maybe wisdom, or maybe I feel like I feel like I I was taught lessons, and then like I have an experience, I'm in, and I make the wrong decision, but quickly I'm able to to lean into an experience or 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 lean into a lesson or something that I've learned somewhere else, um, so that. That's good. Don't don't be afraid to have experiences. Yeah, but don't have one bad experience, which is go to college and come out with like seventy thousand dollars in debt and no job or a job that pays you thirty thousand because that's a really tough one to recover from. You know, honestly, it's that is like the big part of that whole experience of like what's the right amount of debt? Why why should I take any? You know, there, there's a lot of to that, but too many kids. They get hamstrung. They're 25. They don't have a job. They have twenty, thirty thousand dollars in student loan debt, and they're out there praying for student loan forgiveness. So let's let's start there. Let's start there. Not student loan forgiveness because that's either going to happen or it's not. You know, you, we we can plan around that, but that's out of our control. You said you said it's the kid who goes to school, graduates with seventy thousand dollars of debt, um, and is making thirty thousand dollars a year. What is is there is there a good rule of thumb uh, in terms of how much debt? Because look, not all debt's bad. Obviously, it's very difficult to get by in our in our society without taking on some kind of debt. School debt's probably a decent debt, just because we know the statistics of if you have an education, how much that's going to translate in in lifetime income. But what is that right number? Yeah, that, that that's a great question. And there is a number. There's a rule of thumb, you know, and like all rules of thumb, it's general. But the rule of thumb is if you graduate with a debt that's less than or equal to this first year starting salary, you'll be able to pay that off comfortably over time. Right. So I think that that is a pretty good rule of thumb. And those, you know, when you look at the, the defaulters, those who are not paying their student loans, Though the average balance on those loans for like 60% of those kids is under $10,000. It's because they didn't complete college. Kids who get out of college, they get a job. Most of those kids do really well and they can make a good way for themselves and they can pay back the, the debt in good time. So it really is uh, about, I think you said it before, responsible borrowing. Like, right? What's the responsible amount? Don't get in over my head. And please don't do that in your early 20s. If you're if you're thinking about this, it's it's a really important way to start. And I also want one other thing before we get away from it. I say what you say, which is a good responsible amount of debt is actually good for a new a, a student coming out of school. I give this advice to my friends all the time. No kidding. 
three years ago, friend sends me a snapshot of his kids, like 770 credit score. And why? Because he took some debt. He was paying it right through. He had a great credit score. He goes, my friend said, thank you. Because I thought, he said, when you first said this to me, I didn't, I wasn't really too sure. He goes, but now look what happened. Mm, Kid's got yeah. a 770. He's out of school for three years. This is great. Man. That's so, so one of, you know, we're talking about that debt and, and income to, you know, what you come out of school making. So the, one of the burning questions that I get all the time from individuals is what type of financial aid is out there? What should they be looking for? Because it it's changed over the past several years. Yeah. It's, it, and it changes every year and it just sort of evolves. So the, the most important thing uh, that everybody needs to understand is that there are two kinds of financial aid. There's need-based aid and there's merit-based aid, right? And the need-based aid comes from a result of a calculation. And a calculation, we were talking about these FAFSA forms. FAFSA is the acronym for the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, FAFSA. And that goes to the government for any kind of student aid. It's for a federal student loan, for a Pell Grant. Some schools use it for their aid as well. So parents say to me, you know what? I make too much money. My kid's not going to get any financial aid, so I'm not going to file the form. I say, don't make that mistake. You know, it's not the easiest thing, Eric will tell you. It's also not the most difficult thing. It's kind of time consuming a little bit, but you can get it done. So you go, you go get it done. And at least you're in the game for financial aid on a need-based side, including a loan and work study. So absolutely fill out the form. The second kind of aid is merit-based aid. And, you know, my daughter, I love her, uh, but she was not a Rhodes Scholar. She was good kid academically, you know, a little better than the, the pack, but she got merit-based aid offers from three different schools. And those three schools, we lived in the Northeast at the time, those three schools, one of them was in the like Southern Texas, one was in the desert in California, and one was in the cornfields of Indiana. And they were looking for geographical diversity. We didn't apply for mm -hmm. her to get that financial aid. She had her acceptance letter and she said, they're giving me a scholarship. And I thought, you know, I know enough about this. You know, she she was not an athlete at the time. She will, They wanted to fill out their class with a girl from the Northeast and she hit the profile and it was just manna from heaven. It came right down. She mm -hmm. got four years worth of scholarship mm -hmm. and it was great. So need-based aid, merit-based aid. So the the uh, merit-based, like where, where did these colleges pick up her profile from? From the FAFSA? Um, no, from her application. So they knew she was, you know, so okay. the merit-based aid, this is the college's money, yeah. right? You know, so so they said, okay, you know, we, we know she was living outside of Boston. She had this profile. We're, you know, we want her here. Yeah. Let me just, let me just real quick, make a comment on, you just talked about merit-based and um, uh, need-based. Need-based. It's actually the, the content of a recent blog of yours on your website. So if, if you're listening to this, y'all want to check out my college corner. There's fantastic information on there that John and his team put out. So, uh, all right, Xavier, you were about to ask a question. Go ahead. Yeah. So I, I was, so for our listeners, it doesn't matter what your income is. You always want to fill out that FAFSA form. Is that, is that accurate? That's what you're saying. Correct. That, that That's what I'm saying. That, that's right. Okay. So now, John, did, now I, make, follow did up. I make a mistake? Hold on, Xavier. Did, did I make a mistake by, um, they do kind of make it easy. Cause you can, you can, you can, um, uh, I guess have a direct download of your tax return transcript to FAFSA, I feel like right. I made a mistake by doing that. Is that was that? No, true? no, you didn't. No, okay. no, you you saved yourself a headache because okay. it, it pulls off the lines exactly what they want. Just so, it felt yeah. so ex you just feel so exposed. That's it. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you do. My my daughter did the same thing. I was with her on a phone call. She said, "Should I do it or not?" And I said, "I." But my experience from everything that you should just do that. She hit the button, and we went to the next question. And if you had filled it out yourself, you would have spent forty five minutes trying to find it all. So you, you did the right thing there, Eric. This feels more like a therapy session than a podcast. Glad episode. to do it. <laughs> thanks, thanks, John. <laughs> so, John, a, a follow up question to that because you mentioned about the the scholarship that your daughter got. So, right. if an individual uh, qualifies for a scholarship and receives that scholarship, will that affect financial aid in any way? Yeah, great question. Um, so if the school gives you the scholarship, so what happened, let, let's just go like to the very top. I get into the school and the next thing I know, I filed a FAFSA form and right behind the a letter that says, congratulations, you get the, here's your financial aid award, right? And on that financial aid award letter, it will tell you you're eligible for 
in, in the case that I'm saying, no, I'm going to give you, you know, John's college scholarship, right? And you're going to get $5,000 for that. You can get $3,000 Pell Grant. And it will kind of list it all right out right there. So for that aid, that's already included in the package. But what you're saying, uh, Xavier, is really interesting. There are also third-party scholarships. And mycollegecorner.com, there's a scholarship search engine there, right? And you can go through and find a whole bunch of scholarships or whatever you want. Third-party money can reduce the amount of a student aid award letter, uh, so the amount the school might give you. So they might come to you and say, hey, you know, this is really great that your, your kid won, you know, the National Spelling Bee and they got, you know, whatever, thousands of dollars, um, but we're going to reduce the financial aid by that amount. Now, that's what they can do. The schools will tell you they're reluctant to do that. They want okay. to make this kind of as easy as possible. For If you go out and found all these awards, that's great. Right. Okay. So, I'm oh, sorry, the last point on this is really important just to, you know, I'm a sort of, you know, dot the I, cross the T kind of guy. And, and the best advice is go to the financial aid officer at the school and come up, come clean with it. Just say, hey, look, you know, we got this money. Like, how's this going to be treated? Is, uh, how, how does that work? Um, and the other part of that is, you know, make sure that if they're going to actually take back that award money they gave you, I would ask and say, hey, you know, is your award for four years from to the school? You know, is this going to be recurring? Uh, and maybe this is a one time scholarship. So maybe I'll say to the scholarship folks, you know what, they're going to reduce the aid. It's really not worth it for me. So it, there's always devil in the detail around all this stuff. And I think those couple of points I just made should help your listeners um, weave their way through that a little bit better. OK, on that uh, on that point, this not directly tied to scholarships, but let's talk about like college admissions. Like Xavier and I were talking about this um, before before we hit record what are what are colleges looking for these days i got my i got a sophomore okay she's uh yep. she spends she's a dancer she she goes to a school where she's in a creative arts program for dancing spends a lot of time um dancing her grades are good um yep. what's is the college going to look at the fact that she spends time like 30 20 20 30 hours a week dancing for school and dancing for you know the local program does that count more than is it more important for her to have straight A's or to have A's and a couple of B's, but but show you know participation in, in different things? So it's going to depend on the school, right? Uh, so the most highly selective schools, you know, where they have like a five percent admission, you know, mid five percent of the kids, they'll tell you we want a really well rounded kid, and but what they really want are kids who are like well rounded and like superstars and everything, like get straight A's. They're like the you know the ballerina of the year. They're like you know. They go and preach at the local uh, church. You know, it's like you look at these kids. They're like, how does how can you ever get there? And the reality and that's why is there's that, a that's why they had the uh, college scandal, right? <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's right, exactly right. That whole varsity varsity blues. blues uh, yeah. Yes, exactly right. Yeah, they wanted the side. Just, we can talk about that. But yeah. but to answer your question, because it's, it's the perfect question. You know, if if you're going to go to a, a state school. Um, you know, just show that a couple things. One, you've done well in school. You know, not everybody's going to be a valedictorian, but you've done well in school. That's great. You know, you have some outside interests. Um, you know, you're doing something in the community, maybe, you know, whatever that might be, a volunteer for this or that. You have some interest in the school, a club or whatever it might be. If you happen to be a leader of the club, you know, it's that much better. Uh, but they're really, you know, they just want people who are showing that they have some ability to self be self-motivating that they're going to sort of take the bull by the horns at some level mm -hmm. and that they're going to be a successful part of the, this class. And every, every college wants the same thing. They, they say, you know, we want a well-rounded class. And like, what does that mean? And it means all of this, you know, mm -hmm. they need some, they need some experts. So it shouldn't just be academic. We shouldn't push our kids just to get straight A's. We should push them to, to, to be uh, participants in a lot of different clubs and, and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Follow the, follow their passion and their love. And that that's very helpful. And I know our listeners with my question, they're going to think, oh, God, they're they're bouncing all over the place. But look, I, I've got another important question for you. So we, we have we have agendas <laughs> here, John. OK, yeah. we kids that we need to put through college, brother. Come on. I was wondering why you invited me back. Now I know yeah. this is good. <laughs> so know. how can I help? We're going to do this again next year or the year. Right. Yeah, and, and, and just keep doing it every year. So for those who are who are getting ready to start looking at uh, um, applying for college, when should they start thinking about FAFSA and what is the deadline for completing the FAFSA? Great. Um, the, there are two things to this, right? One is, are you, are you hearing me? Yep, you're yes. Good. Oh, yeah. sorry. Oh, sorry. I, my, my AirPod went out to my shirt. So, so this is a great question. 
Um, the FAFSA form is available October 1 of senior year, right? So that's when you can first fill out that form. Before that, so if you have a, if your listeners have freshmen, sophomores, or juniors, it's just good to know what the FAFSA is. And now I've got to like throw a big curveball to you. The FAFSA will now generate a number today called the expected family contribution, right? And that's kind of what this whole thing is about. Next year is a whole new thing. They're going to do the student aid index, which is a different formula. So, um, Eric, I th- is your son a, a senior now? Or no, freshman. The, the, freshman. The freshman. Okay. Okay. So what's going to happen is next year you're going to go fill out that FAFSA form and the calculation is going to come back differently, right? Because they're changing the formula. We can talk about that, but it's a lot of devil in the detail. I don't really know how far you want to d- dive into that. But to answer your really great question, Xavier, senior year, that's when you fill out the form. Before that, you have to know about it. And the other really important thing to know is that the IRS uh, retrieval tool that Eric used took his taxes from two years ago, from 2020. That's okay. the number that he wanted. So another part in it for that is for our listeners, this is an annual thing that they're doing is going in and filling out this FAFSA form. Isn't that correct? For each year that your students in school, you want to do that. So starting senior year in high school, right through junior year in college, you want to fill that out. That's right. And so for those returning um, uh, students, what time is it? Is it the same time frame as you as you're looking for for your senior in high school? Is it later in the year? The form is always available to on October 1st. Uh, and again, so I'm going to give a little caveat here because some of your listeners might uh, wake up on October 1st coming up here and the form might not be there because the government's doing this change. And one of the little hints they're thrown out there is that we might not have available before January 1 or sometime between October 1. But mycollegecorner.com is going to switch out our EFC. It's the calculator, financial aid calculator we have up there now. For an SAI estimator, we're going to do that around the 1st of August. And we'll put a lot of um, information up on the website about when that new calculation is going to take effect. Gotcha. Next question that I've got for you is, and I'm full of questions here. Here we go. So when is a student considered a dependent versus independent? Yeah. So I was going to, uh, in the last little bit, I was going to say, oh, unless the students are graduate students. So, you know, my, my daughter um, did her undergraduate degree. She went out and got a job. She wants to go back to school. So now she's filing her own taxes. She's an independent student. She filed that FAFSA on her own. Like I didn't have any of my information included there. So um, there's some legal definitions for undergrads who might be independent students. And you can go on. Actually, you know, the, the U.S. Department of Education website is really pretty good on all of this. Um, they've done a really good job of making that information available and really clear. So if you're not sure, you're an undergraduate, maybe there's some sp- special circumstance where the student's on their own. Um, they may qualify even as undergrads um, as an independent, uh, not a dependent student. Bottom line, if you're if you're claiming your child on your tax return, they're probably, they're going to be a dependent student. So what if you don't claim your child? What if someone doesn't claim their child because the child, you know, is working, has enough income, they file their own return. Yeah. So then they're, they're independent. Yeah. Both my daughters are now independent, you know, they're, they're out once they're in the working world. Like I said, some undergrads actually could qualify as independent depending on their status. And there's very clear definition is that on the federal student aid website fsa.org i think it is so so if a kid if a kid is working they're in college they're working they file their own tax return they could technically do the faster on their own uh well no they need to be independent so uh so filing their taxes for their job may not qualify them necessarily for being independent so this is one of those things where you say consult your tax advisor you know like if you're on tv that's what i would make sure you consult your tax advisor so um, maybe you guys as uh, professionals understand all that a little better than I do, but um, I would consult my tax advisor. So if if a child has has claim or claim dependent, how hard is it to change a dependency status if something were to occur throughout the year for that following so, year? Uh, so you're saying they you they file the dependent and then all of a sudden they become an independent student going forward? Correct. Um, so they, they get a job and, uh, you know, their their sophomore year of school or their junior year yeah. of school. And now they've got that income coming in. They're going to go out there and, and file their own taxes that second their second year in school. 
Is it hard to change uh, their de their dependency status? Uh, it's not, it's not going to be difficult to change it, but uh, the question is, you know, why would you change it? You know, my, when my girls were in school, they had a part-time job here or there, and they were paying some tax. Like over the summer, they were earning some money or whatever, but they were still dependents of ours for tax purposes. Okay. And so, again, that's why I say, you know, go back and, and you know, talk to the tax advisor. Uh, I, I, I always, by the way, I err on the side of not giving advice in areas I'm not 100% sure of. So mm -hmm. I'm not 100% sure here. So I would go consult an, a, a, an expert in this area. Okay, perfect. So let me let me ask you this question. Maybe maybe you could speak to this. Let's just let's just assume for a second, okay, that um, client doesn't claim their their child as a defendant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, does that individual, the, does, does the college student have a better chance of qualifying for financial aid because of the fact that they're not, mom yeah. and dad's income isn't isn't being reported and they're kind of standing on their own? Yeah, you know, if they're in a high earning uh, household, that, that could well be uh, that they would because the, the way the formula is set up, it's mostly income driven. They take in your asset, but they really, they, they're, these crazy asset protection allowances and the formula, the algorithm is really pretty complicated. But if you're thinking you're mostly income to, uh, driven in that formula, you're thinking the right way, uh, which gets back, back to my earlier point with some high earning families. I'm not going to file that form because my kid's not going to get any financial aid. Well, they might not get need based aid, but you might want them to get a loan. Right. So in order to get one of the federal direct loans, which is in the student's name and the benefit of the, the federal programs for students, is tremendous. One, you know, not even Silicon Valley Bank would make a loan to an 18 year old without an income. Right. So right. <laughs> unless they had, a, unless they is, had a startup tech company. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. So, okay. so, but so who's going to like lend to an 18 year old with no income and no job on them? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So the government does that. And the other thing that the government does is that there are two flavors of that direct student loan. One is subsidized and one is unsubsidized. So if it's a really low income family, they could get a subsidized loan, which means the government will pay the interest while they're in school. So you start with a $10,000 loan, make it, I'm going to say 5,500 because that's what a freshman is eligible for, 5,500. They get that 5,500 direct loan with the subsidized with the subsidy to it, they get out with a five thousand five hundred dollar loan, and then they can go and pay that over time. And the other thing that's really important with these federal loans is that they are they've made a huge amount of headway in the last ten years to help make it easier for students with jobs to pay. And so now you can call your student loan servicer, and there are literally today nine. Biden wants to add one more, but there's nine different repayment programs based on what your circumstances are. So, you know, advice, if, if somebody's listening, they've got a kid coming out of school, I say, look, the very first thing you should do when this pause on these payments stops, call that student loan servicer and say, okay, here's my situation, which program is best for me, right? And some of those programs will say, you know, you can only spend up to 10% of your disposable income on your student loan. And by the way, if you don't uh, pay it all off in 15 or 20 years, then the rest is going to be forgiven. So, uh, they've made some headway to try and make it a lot easier for kids to pay these loans. And there's, you know, we've been talking about financial aid, but there there are actually a couple of, of, of uh, vehicles out there that individuals use um, to help save towards college. Um, mm -hmm. On your website, can individuals go out there and look at, you know, what is a 529 plan? What is an educational IRA? Um, I'm assuming you have information on that on your website as well. We do, and we post articles, and we had some videos up from time to time. There's some web, uh, some webinars up there for free as well. You can go and check them out. By the way, I'm coming to New Orleans because there's a 529 college savings uh, uh, conference there. Uh, college Savings Foundation is a group of across the country of these folks who started these great programs back in the 90s. Um, the beautiful thing about the 529s is that you know there's a really significant tax benefit. Once you put the money in there, you don't pay any tax on that um, unless you don't use it for college, basically. Mm -hmm. And now uh, they've they've broadened it out again over the last few years. You can use it for up to ten thousand dollars for student loans. You can use it for some apprenticeships. You can use it for um, secondary schools, so you know private high schools. Um, so there is a real advantage now in and the tax advantage five twenty nine savings programs. And does that affect uh, the uh, financial aid for the student at at, at all? Um, I'm going to say not anymore because some of the changes that they're making is to allow 
uh, it used to be that if grandparents had uh, 529, and let's say I have one for my my grandchild, which is still a theoretical grandchild, so it's a theoretical account. <laughs> but let's just say you know I had a grandchild and I had an account. If if I were to withdraw that money today and give it to them for college, the way the formula was up until this year, it said, well, uh, this is income to the student, and it would have been um, basically I'm going to say tax, but it would have been it would reduce their their financial aid. They've changed all that um, going forward so that all distributions now going to a, to a student uh, won't have any effect. Um, I think it's like 5.64% is the number of the, of, is the percentage that the financial aid would be reduced if you had a 529. So like very simple math, if you're going to get $10,000 of financial aid and you had uh, $1,000 of savings, you know, in this 529, your financial aid would be reduced by $56. So, you know, clearly, you're better off saving than you know taking that little bit of reduction in that financial aid than not saving the money and, and having to borrow some. What's the difference in impact if I've got ten thousand dollars in a five twenty nine plan or ten thousand dollars in just a regular investment account? Yeah, so in that investment account, you've probably been paying taxes uh, during the course, uh, you know, for gains or whatever as you're buying and selling securities. When you're when they're sitting in those in five twenty nines, there's no tax on that throughout. And there's no tax on it um, when you make the, so you do the liquidation for the college uh, bill, there's no tax on that as long as you're using it for tuition, room, board, computers. Like basically, if you're going to school, you're going to be able to use that for a qualified educational expense, a QEE. Do, do the feds look at 529 savings different than investment account savings in terms of the calculation? They do. They, they, they do. And and the 529 savings is an advantaged uh, savings. Okay. So that, that'll, all things being equal, income, everything else, if I've got 100,000 in a 529 plan or 100,000 in a, in a brokerage account, I'm going to get more aid having the 529 uh, plan. Oh, so I'm sorry. You're, you're going to get more bang for the buck out of the 529 because you're not going to pay taxes okay. on your distribution of your out of your taxable account. So you had a hundred thousand, you know, what, what, you know, whatever your capital gains was, yeah. that, that's where you're going. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So what are some, what are some resources that, um, that our listeners should be listening to? Uh, obviously we've, we've got um, uh, your website as one of the resources uh, what are some of the other resources that they can take a look at? Is is the IRS website a good place to go? I think uh, federal student aid, so FSA.org, uh, probably FSA.gov. Um, I, I should have looked it up before we came on, but uh, FSA.gov, I think, is the site. And that's the federal student aid. And they have all the information about these different programs, how the federal aid programs and work. Um, that That's good. The second um, great source of information really is on the college website as well. Um, when we were talking earlier about the need-based aid and the form, the FAFSA form, uh, I didn't want to get us uh, too far in the weeds, but there is another form that the college board sponsors called the profile. And some of the private colleges actually use that form as a secondary source of information. And it, the, the website so, is student, it's studentaid.gov. Studentaid.gov? Yeah, student yeah thank you. <clears throat> so that, that's the website. There's a lot of really great information there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, as I said, the the colleges, and I go to school counselors as well. You know, high school counselors they don't like to talk about money, uh, but a lot of times they'll have insight into local scholarships that might be available, or they may know something because some student went to a particular school and say, oh, you know, check with their aid office and ask about this or that. So the uh, again, the the high school uh, school counselors. They're just not, uh, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, money and, and, and academics and like, you know, where do you learn about money? They don't want to talk to kids about money. It's too personal, you know, and they have enough, you know, say there are three fits, right? You want to have a great academic fit. You want to have a great social fit. And then you and I and, and your listeners, hopefully we're talking about a great financial fit, right? Mm -hmm. High school counselors don't want to talk about financial fit because they got to start talking about the FAFSA and all kinds of things that they really don't want to get involved with. And but frankly, they don't have the time to, right? Yeah. They've got enough on their hands. You know, you know what I found too, and I, and I had these conversations early with my son, and I would highly recommend parents start having these conversations with their high schoolers. You know, their their freshmen, just the expectation for for college, expectation of who's going to pay. Are you the parent going to take the you know foot the entire bill? Is there going to be an expectation for your child to 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 work, your child to take debt, 
Um, but to have those conversations now, that'll actually start to get your kids thinking. I mean, the kids are smart. High schoolers are smart. And if you have that conversation and say, hey, I'm going to pay the entire ticket, they're not thinking about cost. But if you go in there and say, hey, look, you know, I'm willing to put up some towards college. You're going to have to put up some towards college. You're going to have to take out debt and you shouldn't take out more debt than what you're expected to make in your first year. They start thinking about these things and and the cost, the the cost of college, because it is, it is wild. My, we're looking at colleges for my daughter and she, she wants to go to a, a place that has dance and she's looking at some of these conservatories and oh my God, yeah, like, who goes to these, who pays that much money? That's right. Well, you know, the other important thing here is when you go on the website and you have that like heart attack and say, okay, nobody can afford. Well, here's the truth. The average tuition discount is 50%. Crazy. So if oh. you look, if you look and see, oh, it's $75,000, there's no way we can do that. You know what? The average kid there is probably paying less than 40. Yeah. Now it's 40 still a big it's number. Still, it's still wrong. a big number, John. Yeah, it's still, but, but there's a difference between the yeah. sticker price and the net price. Right. And, and that's what you, that's what you really need to know. The, the other thing, Eric, I, I, this, this is the hardest uh, conversation to ever have. So I do these things like you do. And I sit in parent group, two things, right? Student loans should be the last resort, not the first option to pay for college, right? I think I firmly believe that. And two, don't raid your retirement savings to pay for your kid's college, right? That's, that's, that's a good one. Is, Can you say that again? Say that one more time. Yeah. Do not raid your retirement for your kid's college. It's bad, bad, bad. And uh, by the way, you can read about this like in the financial press. I read it in the Wall Street Journal every once in a while. It's great. Take a loan against your own. Like, this is the worst financial advice you could possibly give a family. But the, the reason I, I say all this is that at the end of the day, the family has total control over whether or not they go into too much debt because they could find a cheaper school. And so this is a hard reality, right? Because you want to go to brand name X and guess what? Sally's best friend, Karen's going to that school and they've got to go together and it's very emotional and there's so much wrapped up into that. But if you can just step back a little bit and more and more families are doing this now. So you know what? Why do you want to go to this school for that major when you can come here, another school, maybe a half or a third of the price and not put yourself in financial jeopardy when you get out of school? Right. That's the hard conversation. That's the emotional one. And I, I, some of my friends have said, look, I tried it. I didn't do it. I wound up uh, I doing more than I should have done. And, you know, but that is I, when. So I say to these parent groups, everybody does what you guys did. They should. Yeah, that's right. That perfect common sense. And then the next thing I say is two thirds or more of you will walk out of here. You will go and make that mistake because it's really hard. When we're sitting here together yeah. singing Kumbaya, we're all singing. But when you got to sit across from your kid and say, I don't want you to go to that brand name school. Good luck. It's an easier conversation than when you have when you start having it when they're in eighth grade or ninth grade. Absolutely. Not wait, not wait till junior year and they have their heart set on, you know, Stanford. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. You know, so we say, you know, like we have a college search up there on my college corner. Like, let the kids go and just like find some schools. Like, let them see how much it is. Like, and then we can start like talking about some of this. I think it's a great, that's, that's a really good piece of advice, Eric. That's at top of the list. Yeah. Let me reiterate one thing that you just said. Do not take money out of your retirement account to pay for college. It, your, your kids have a far better chance of paying off a student loan over their lifetime than you do recovering from using your retirement money to actually be able to retire. There are no such thing as retirement loans. No such well, thing. And, and that and that's one of the things that I, you know, that I was I was going to close with is look, we can't borrow money for our retirement. We can borrow money for education. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's right. exactly right. John, what are, what are, if we haven't already discussed it, what are maybe some, some top things that you're kind of seeing right now in, in, in the college space that our listeners need to know about? Uh, well, there are a couple of things. Um, one of them is the pandemic was terrible for everyone. And, and, you know, I talked to a high school group the other day and before we got on, I asked the counselor, so are you guys back to normal? I said, yeah, in the classroom we are, but like emotionally we're not. Right. So um, this has been a really tough time for people. And so I think one, recognizing that it, it has been extraordinarily difficult for everyone, including the schools, right? There's been a record number of turnovers of, of presidents of the universities in the last year or two for, for obvious reasons. And the only reason I say that is when you're dealing with people on the other side, just recognize that they, they have a job to do too. And, and like if you're the better, the nicer you are to that and kind of understand that it helps, particularly, so we didn't talk about this. You get that financial aid award letter and you say, you know what? I need another $5,000 to go to the school. You can appeal that award letter. 
Um, and it's an appeal. It's not a negotiation. So you don't want to call a school up and say, oh, by the way, you know, my kid's got this. And, I, and so I can go to this other school. So we want you to give me five thousand dollars more. You, know, you, you approach it in a whole different way. Recognize what they've been through and say, look, we really want to do this. And, and, and so approach it from from that perspective. Mm. I think it, it's really helpful. The other thing is um, there's been this um, really um, significant move away from testing, you know, test optional and like all that sort of. Uh, that may be a little bit of a fad because when you talk to some of the school administrators, they say, look, that's true, but you know, we're still giving our merit money to the top kids. And the way we find out who the top kids are is, you know, those we're looking at test scores sometimes. And so, you know, I, I was a terrible test taker. Like if I could have avoided it at all costs, I, I would have. Um, but I, I think in some ways there's like a little lulling going on here that, you know, don't worry too much about the test. I, I think the tests are actually, um, they're not going to lose their importance. They're evolving. They're kind of probably be a little bit better predictors, but um, I wouldn't get um, sucked into that trap. And then the last piece of this, we, we, we bypassed it, uh, but um, students in high school, college today are going to have to repay their loans. Okay, so don't take a loan thinking that it's going to be forgiven. It's really bad. Uh, it's a really bad way of thinking about getting in that financial uh, structure. Can't do that. Yeah, that's good. That's good, man. Oh, so much stuff here. I wish I would have had this conversation last week before I filled out FAFSA. So I wouldn't have to <laughs> suffered throughout the weekend feeling, uh, feeling like I did something wrong. So thanks for normalizing this, John. <laughs> well, Eric, you did, you did the right lot. thing. Thanks. Yeah, it, it's a, it's a huge thing. And just think about it, you're a financial professional and you had that, right? You know, the, the person the, who doesn't do this day in and day out, um, it, it's really can be overwhelming. But so last point here, mm -hmm. people like you are playing a really important role with their clients trying to, like you said, normalize it, make it real and make just help people understand it's going to be OK. Right. Don't don't do anything sort of blatantly crazy, like go out and get a huge amount of debt. But like play it down the fairway and it's going to work out. Okay. You've got great kids. They've done really well so far. There's no reason to think all of a sudden they're going to fall off the rails. So just, you know, make the right bet on your kid and, and trust them with all the years you raised them. You've done a great job. Man, we're doing good until you said play it down the fairway. I cannot hit a fairway to save, to save my life. <laughs> Come on, man. John, thanks for we're taking so time. Close. Today. Yeah. I oh, it's great it. to be with you all. Yeah. Appreciate well, your time today. And y'all, for listeners, well. listeners, if you know people who have kids that are in high school getting ready to go to college, share this. Follow us, you know, follow us um, wherever you listen to your podcast and share this on social media. This is a really important um, conversation. So thanks again, John. And and last oh. last thing I do want to point out is definitely take a look at um, mycollegecorner.com. Right. It's good stuff there. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, guys. Be well. Take care.